Good evening, please take your seats. Good evening. Can you hear me? No. Good evening, and thank you for joining, joining us tonight or surviving the long but intense and extremely interesting day. Um, for the keynote lecture in the Symposium Architecture and the State, 1940s to 1970s. It is with gr great pleasure that I introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Mark Rinzen from the School of Arts, Histories and Cultures at the University of Manchester. Professor Crimson has written extensively on the formation of architecture as a profession in England, and especially on the relationship between architectural education, theory and practice in the metropole and the British colonies. He studies not only range over an extensive period from the 17th century through Victorian England to the post-colonial era, but also move across disparate geographies such as the Middle East, Southeast Asia and West Africa. Professor Crimson's ability to address questions of national architectural production as part of an intricate web of institutions, cultural imaginaries, and power relations that exceeds and bridges territorial boundaries is of particular interest for our symposium, in which we attempt to address the architectural operation within the state as one that is inevitably immersed within and conditioned by an international or globalized arena of possibilities and constraints. At the same time, Professor Crimson's studies challenge us, as we did today, to check ourselves when we are referring to the concept of the state as a coherent entity, rather than as a particular form of intersection or juxtaposition of contesting and sometimes mutually exclusive group of in groups of interests. His list of publications includes Modern Architecture and the End of Ma Empire, published in 2003 that won the prestigious 2006 Spiro Kosov Award given by the Society of Architectural Historians. Empire Building, Victorian Architecture and Orientalism, published in 1996. Architecture, Art or Profession, 300 Years of Architectural Education in Britain, co-authored with Jules Slobak, published in 1994. And he has edited Urban Memory, History and Amnesia in Modern City in the Modern City, published in 2005. His forthcoming publications include a co-edited book with Claire Zimmerman titled No Avant-Garde to, to the Postmodern, Postwar Architecture in Britain and Beyond, to be published in September 2010 with Yale. He is currently researching a book on the early work of James Sterling, provisionally titled James Sterling and Architecture in Postwar Britain. Tonight, the title of his talk gathers together a curious, and if I may say so, appetizing composition of ingredients. From Haifa to St Stephen Age, the British avant-garde, colonialism, and the welfare state. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Rinson. Thank you for those uh, very generous comments. Um, and thanks uh, very much to Maria, um, to Ayala and Marta for inviting me here. It's been a very exciting conference um, and I feel as if my job perhaps is, is to speculate. Um, the paper that I've written is an attempt to bring together some of my um, kind of older work on, coloni on, coloni on, coloni on colonialism with some of my more re uh, recent work on James Sterling and James Gowan and try to speculate about the connections between them. Um, the architecture culture of early 1950s Britain has uh, long been regarded as an exemplary moment in the history of modernism. Here was a critical flashpoint when, mo when, when modernism had achieved the state's endorsement and new antinomies and antagonisms were articulated between the architects and architecture of the welfare state and that of a younger third generation group of, of, of apostate modernists. 
I think it's worth spelling out what the literature on this subject often assumes about the broader framework. If the state is an apparatus of institutions responsible for uh, constitutionality, government, welfare, and redistribution, then this took a specific form in the post-war social democratic welfare state where the remit for health, education, mass transport, and social services was expanded and certain industries nationalized. The architectural profession um, immediately took on a considerably expanded public responsibility through departments that, within the state's institutions, provided for the design, construction, maintenance, and other uh, means of securing building stock. The welfare state thus brought architecture into a new relation with the state. No longer allowed monumental expression of the state's symbolic powers, instead architectural production uh, ramified through the state's many organs. By such means, the welfare state represented itself in space, marking its boundaries, inscribing itself urbanistically onto its own territory, and making material its redistributive logic. How do we identify the avant-garde in all this? Now, four rival schools of thought or models can be stylized for the relation between the avant-garde and the welfare state. The first is the avant-gardists' own. Here, the welfare state's architects were characterized as other to what the avant-garde uh, was about. This involved certain stereotypes, the effeminate festival of Britain, the new establishment of second generation state architects with their diluted or picturesque modernism. But the avant-garde, many of whose members were employed by the welfare state, was not in itself critical of the, of the welfare state, or at least not until the late 1960s. Rather, in the avant-garde's view, theirs was an attempt to substantiate the naming of the state as ethical with an equally ethical architecture. In a second model, the avant-garde are seen to reject are seen to reject everything that the welfare state and its architecture stood for, but are ambivalent about alternatives, especially how to engage with working class culture. This model creates a narrative about how this ambivalence then, a little later, becomes a form of selling out to middle class ideals of consumerism, seen as false tokens of liberation. One variation within this is a trajectory constructed to account for James Sterling's work, in which the architect is portrayed as eviscerating or, or reducing to mere collage or representation the historical avant-garde's attempts to make architecture act as a nucleus of social precipitation. The wide promenade decks of his student dormitories at St Andrews on the top right here uh, for example, are thus deemed a kind of end point in an entropic series, remaking streets in the sky for a long-haired student body, caught merely in theatrical form somewhere between the communal bar and the atomistic study room. The hope of a social housing become an empty signifier. In a third revivalist model, the avant-garde uh, turn out to be heroes again, but in a broader compass than just the welfare state. They ride but also rechannel the waves of consumerism, mediatization, or developers' mass housing, presenting radical reevaluations and alternative visions of how people should live in the world, seeking freedom and authenticity. Perhaps despite their author's intentions, one might say that because this avant-garde work floats free of the social and political context of the welfare state, the avant-garde also become paragons of a kind of individualist neoliberalism. Um, 
And a fourth model, drawn by more distanced architectural historians, the avant-garde are essentially just a variation within a larger theme. Emphasis is placed on the avant-garde as reflecting on the history of modernism, working on problems that had innovative value but little or no critical import in relation to the architecture of the welfare state and revaluing the culture of contemporary everyday life but only in relation to established cultural hierarchies and only to create an architecture appropriate for the new post-war sorry for the new world of post-war plenty Overlap between the avant-garde and the mainstream, particularly at the London County Council, is crucial to this model. Essentially, research and development specialists, the avant-garde act first as necessary visionaries within a collective enterprise of rebuilding Britain, and then as the creators of plural styles within modernism. There's also a fifth viewpoint which I should should mention, which, which is found usually in the work of sociologists and, and social historians. It's not re really a model. It's a, a kind of total rejection of any distinction between the avant-garde and um, the and welfare state architecture. One could say that these models um, operate the way they do because of how they are placed relative to larger historical and critical contexts of modernism, of post-war British architecture, of post-war reconstruction, or of the tendencies of some global architecture culture. They can be broadly aligned with the period in which they were written and the geography of their writing, the contemporary view, the view from Venice, the transatlantic view, the insular view. But I'm not really concerned with um, adjudicating here what my paper attempts to do is quite simple. First, to insert a third term into this relationship, that of colonialism. And then to ask what happens to our, um, to our, to our, to our understanding of the relation between the avant-garde and the welfare state when we reassert or reconstruct a context for it that takes colonialism into account. If this conjuncture is surprising, then that is a function both of a kind of willed forgetting at the time and, uh, and either a lack of interest or a separation into discrete expertises in architectural and cultural history since. The British Empire is simply not seen as a useful reference point in accounts of post-war modernism and the avant-garde, or even of the British uh, welfare state. I mean, most historians who've, who've written histories of, of, the, of the British welfare state do not mention colonialism. Architectural development is described as if it occurred separately from the imperial world. We've had to choose between the two rather than understanding how they might be sometimes casually, sometimes tensely related. Part of the reason for this, I would suggest, is that de decolonization was either completed in the progressive imagination at a time when it had hardly even started on the ground, or it was regarded as a kind of epiphenomenon, outside and barely related to contemporary Britain. As one cultural historian uh, has written, the speed of the process of de decolonization and the seemingly unreal abstract images by which the majority of domestic Britons came to think of it made the whole thing rather mysterious. It could all seem like a nasty trick whose provenance was unknown. Yet still, in 1950, of course, large areas of Africa, South Asia, Australasia and the Americas were in British hands. The Commonwealth merely veiled the continuing imperial control. Colonies kept their sterling balances in London, and the empire was Britain's major supplier of food and raw materials, a constant presence in the consumption habits of daily life. Little wonder then that behind Whitehall doors, policy makers were, were as attuned to Britain's exploitation of its empire as they were to its relation to Europe 
or the USA. So this forgetting of empire in the wider culture, or at least its world separation, was a kind of necessary contradiction as British society seemed more concerned with new technologies, new forms of consumption, images of wartime heroism, and the insular melancholies of an industrial civilization in its twilight years. Let me um, use an anecdote as a way into this. James Gowan, who became James Sterling's partner between 1956 and 1963, told me about his experiences working for Stevenage Newtown in the early 1950s. Stevenage was built in Hertfordshire, north of London, as a place where people displaced by bombing and slum clearance might resettle. Gowan applied for a job in the architect's office and was appointed site unseen because he'd worked for Powell and Moyer, a young firm catapulted into the limelight by winning a competition to design a huge public housing scheme on the bank banks of the Thames in Pimlico in, in West London. On Gowan's first day at Stevenage, he was picked up at the office by the chief architect with his driver. At great length, Gowan was driven um, right around the town and at the end asked for, 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 for his opinion. In his frank Glaswegian way, Gowan didn't hold back. The roads rambled ineffectually, he said. There was no town, town centre to speak of. It was all too dull. The chief architect brooded but said little or nothing in reply. Now, there's a lot of remembering here. Gowan is a fund of such anecdotes, and the story as he tells it, and has retold it over the years, makes much of the contrast between a, a hopelessly arid architect official, the unimaginative tall estate policy, and a young and idealistic neophyte, someone who believed he knew better what a post-war uh, new town should be like. But what is almost as interesting is what is forgotten and not so much by Gowan as by the culture at large. The dull architect was, was Clifford Holliday. When I told Gowan uh, that I knew the name, he, he uh, was surprised. Yes, I told him. Uh, Holliday was a big cheese architect in Britain's Mediterranean empire between the wars. In 1922, he had succeeded C.R. Ashby, a city architect and town planning advisor to the British Mandate government in Palestine, and he stayed there until 1935. Before Stevenage, he also worked in Colombo and Gibraltar. What, that man who, who seemed just a functionary? Actually, uh, yes, and his architecture was pretty interesting too. His private practice in Jerusalem had produced a number of well-integrated, uh, well solemnly picturesque buildings, wishful, test, wishful testimony to Britain's historical sympathies with the region. The best of these is St Andrew's Church of Scotland, 1927-30. One feels slightly as if one has committed the historian's cardinal sin of tampering with the archive. But if it might seem that Gowan's story is rather spoilt, it's actually taken on a different dimension. More recently, when he tells it, there's a coda, which is about if only he had known Holiday had designed such beautiful buildings, he could have bonded with the older man. And now there is, there is also a new story, one he says he's only told me. So I'll share that with you now. One day, Holiday came into the studio where Gowan worked with other members of his section. He went over to the drawing board where the section's planner had his uh, neighbourhood unit laid out. This seemed never to change. The planner had laboured over it for months with, with little apparent advance. Holiday looked at it and mumbled, is this the best you can do? The planner replied rather, rather too boldly, that it was compiled exactly to the residential standards required 
Holliday looked unimpressed, turned on his heels and left. Now, it's not much of a story, again, and I don't feel especially privileged to, to have heard it, but the point is clear. The dull forms of Stevenage's diluted garden city and the grinding bureaucracy of work there were not actually the product of a dry and dutiful architect, but rather of the system itself, of the state of architecture and architecture seen as the state. But if it might seem that Holiday is exculpated, only a little delving will find that he, that he had not been appointed to Stevenage without good reason. The Garden City vision had achieved a kind of alliance with Zionism's anti-urbanism in, in Mandate Palestine and set the task of representing the synthesis of preserved old town, planned community and agricultural hinterland were a succession of British planners, which Holiday joined when he worked on plans for Haifa, Lod and Jerusalem. With Holiday then, the Garden City returns, perhaps with a Levantine tinge, but more certainly with the experience of rolling it out to demand, the type tested for both its regional adaptability and its universalism. Now, Holiday's Stevenage fate, or was it really his apotheosis, is a particular version of a scenario common to his generation of architect planners, if one little noticed in architectural and planning history. A large part of that often anonymous uh, work of campaigning for, then designing and planning Britain's post-war rebuilding, was done by men and women who had either grown up in the colonies or who had worked substantially within them and who were suited by disposition as much to the command necessary to determine the form taken by large expanses of, of the built environment as to stalking the state's corridors of power or running large architectural offices. Take, take the brothers Johnson Marshall, for instance. Percy worked as a senior planner with the London County Council for 10 vital years from 1949 to 1959. And his brother, Stirrett, was the leading architectural light in the Hertfordshire schools and then chief architect to the Ministry of Education. Both were born in Ajma, India. Their father worked for the government of, 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 for the government of India's salt department and was, poti was posted to, to Derasna, which later achieved fame because it was the place where Gandhi led his protest against the salt tax. Attending the same school as the Johnson Marshals at Uttakamund was Basil Spence, who was born in Bombay. Um, interestingly, Uttakamund was noted in the 1920s as a hill town that appealed to, quote, those who fly from the taxes, rents, servants, and labor troubles of England, unquote. In a career notable for many prestigious projects, Spence was uh, to design the, the high-rise Hutchinson Town Council housing in the Gorbals area of Glasgow. That's the slide on the left. Um, his uh, project is the one it, in virtually the, the middle of that picture. William Holford, who was largely responsible for drafting the Town and Country Planning Act of 1947 and, and uh, uh, was the architect responsible for Paternoster Square beside St Paul's Cathedral, was born and brought up in South Africa. South African born also was Jacqueline Turwitt, who became Director of Studies at the uh, at the Influential School of Planning and, and Research for Regional Development. Patrick, Patrick Abercrombie, the author of The County of London Plan, 1943, and The Greater London Plan, 1944, as well as several other important post-war plans for, for, for rebuilding British cities, was equally at home redesigning Dublin, Hong Kong, Addis Ababa, or, as he had done uh, with Holiday, 
Haifa. Colin Buchanan, um, who wrote the, the famous 1963 report, Traffic in Towns, and before that um, worked for the Ministry of Town and Country, sorry, and before that was the Ministry of Town and Country Planning's chief overseer of planning inquiries into slum clearance, before the war had worked for the Public Works Department in Sudan. I could go on. The point is that we have a phenomenon, perhaps the equal of the much discussed influx of continental modernists into Britain in the 1930s, but unlike that, one, one which has been uh, nearly completely ignored both then and since. I'm not arguing some simple transmission here, exporting and importing. Holiday's watered-down Garden City aesthetics could have been produced by architect planners without any colonial experience. Likewise, there is no sign of Palestine in, in, in Stevenage. But what there is here is the assumption of a big stage of operations, a colonial frame of reference, a global sphere of activities. Garden cities might appear nearly anywhere, in Cairo or Bombay as much as in Hertfordshire. And British architect planners might likewise in the Sudan or Ceylon as much as Southampton. So many of these post-war architect planners had grown up in, in colonial settings, in the confident if, if rootless environments of the ruling colonial power and in private schools that had imbued them with a sense of chivalric idealism, the confidence to command, coupled with the obligation to serve. Some had worked in the colonies in situations that gave them great scope, and where the ethic of public service meant that assuming the response, sorry, assuming the, the authority to direct large numbers of people, resources or tracts of land was taken for granted. One shouldn't overgeneralize here. There are, um, there are some interesting examples of such uh, architect planners attempting to foil more aggressive, in, more aggressive uh, imperious acts. But broadly, the combination of the imperial myth of natural authority and the fashionable 1930s leftism of many uh, from within this caste meant they believed not that they had worked in the service of colonial oppression and exploitation, but for the collective good within a benevolent, modernized state. The social, the social democratic language, one might argue, enhanced the justification for intervention on a large scale, while the administrative techniques shared with and often developed and tested in the colonies were put to use in the mother country. To resolve the problems of architecture for millions was how Percy Johnson Marshall described his task, in a fusion of colonialist paternalism and gropius-like social housing. This might be seen as redemptive, but it was also assumed to be an almost natural right that, that will be carried forward by control of technical expertise, both in the welfare state and beyond it in the post-imperial world. Here is how jo Johnson Marshall drew his lineage. Quote, Our father, as an imperial government official, embodied something of the empire's essence, and he endeavoured to pass on the good and bad traditions of what was to him a total dedication to the British Empire by one or two lucky, by, by one or two lucky accidents more positive aspects of this dedication were metamorphosed into a lifelong task of creating a better human environment, unquote. Now, um, using the writing of Henri Lefebvre and, and Christine Ross on post-war France, we can understand the everyday life world of imperial centres at this time as invested by or colonized by capitalism. And the term uh, colonized is not used loosely here. It means an extension of the forms of imperialism itself into the metropole as the state reordered its own compact with its electorate and remade its responsibilities for urban planning and, 
and housing in the post-war world. The practices of colonialism outlived their history in the colonies themselves and took on adapted forms in the metropole. So rather than the surface effects of self-congratulation and forgetting as empire was decolonized in these years, we see instead a continuation of colonialism in a reordering of the world whereby the processes of imperialism have taken on new configurations at a local and, and global level. Or even, as Ross suggests, quote, the colonies are in some sense replaced and the effort that once went into maintaining and disciplining a colonial people and situation becomes instead concentrated on a particular level of metropolitan existence, unquote. In France, this took the familiar form of an urban geography reiterating relations in the colonial periphery. The ethnicization of inner cities into impoverished and, and racialized zones. At the same time as the country uh, worried at its cultural col uh, colonization by the United States. In Britain, immigrant workers tended to work in other sectors of the welfare state than the construction industry, and the zoning took on forms that were, at least initially, based on class, but with new powers and scope distributed among local and state authorities that echo the colonial experiences of many of its architectural and planning bureaucrats. No doubt there are other differences too, but it is striking that, that Ross and Lefebvre's insights on France have not been carried over into similar studies of colonial and post-colonial Britain. Gowan's anecdotes then have taken us some way, but I want to change tack uh, now and look at Gowan's partner-to-be, James Sterling, in these same years, the early 1950s. Normally, this period in Sterling's career is only discussed in terms of his connections with the avant-garde, with the independent group, Team 10, the Smithsons. But the same circuitry, the connections between architecture, the state and empire, were not so much stumbled upon by Sterling, as in Gowan's case, but fundamental to the cultures he passed through, from his father, ship's engineer for the world transiting Blue Funnel Line, to his childhood spent in the port city of Liverpool, to his training at the most important centre for producing imperial architects, the Liverpool School of Architecture, where both Holiday and the Johnson Marshalls had all studied. After Liverpool, Sterling enrolled in the, in the two-year course at the School for Planning and Research for Regional Development in London. The school's staff included Jacqueline Turwitt, Colin Buchanan and the ubiquitous Percy Johnson Marshall. And it was famed for its specialist expertise in training architect planners for the colonies. But Sterling found almost immediately that he'd made a mistake and was unsuited to the school's aim to train its students to appreciate the wider issues of the economic and political situation. He left after only a year of the two-year course, having, as he put it, quote, learned everything except 3D physical. It was so boring, all about sociology, not architecture he wrote, and more, and more tellingly, they rarely got down to urban planning, being more concerned with national and regional problems, which I thought unrealistic, as decisions at that level are more likely to be political, unquote. The course aborted, Sterling joined the planning division of the London County Council's architects department, but was sacked after only five weeks. Sterling... Sorry, Sterling failed before he'd even become a state architect. He'd followed the accepted pattern of training geared to producing the new architect planner required by the welfare state. But his dissatisfaction with the concentration on politics more than design and Gowans with the effects of, 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 of bu 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 bureaucratized design at Stevenage were important formative experiences putting them both off public sector employment for life, if not of working as private architects on state commissions. Later, Sterling 
um, articulated his criticism of this production line. Quote, we trained a whole lot of town planners who, who immediately became employed by the central or state local authorities, almost without exception, and as such became their handmaidens. Uh, they put into effect the local politicians' desire for progress and hence took us down the paths of urban motorways and towel box. And then by sending the industry out there, they initiated the process of disintegration of the unity of the city. It all comes down to you as a mathematical equation. In England, it's always been political. Every, ru ruling, every ruling political party wants to say they've built up more houses than the previous government, unquote. Sterling's next move after the London County Council was to join James Cubitt and partners. One of the mainstream or middling modernist practices picking up steam at this time. Cubitt's was developing a reputation through its West End shops and school and government buildings in, in the British colonies. When Sterling started there in late 1952, he stayed for six months, the firm had major commissions for a huge, uh, a huge pharmaceutical plant at Rangoon in Burma and the technical co college at Kumasi uh, in present-day Ghana on its drawing boards. Some rumours have associated Sterling with the firm's South Africa tr uh, travel centre, probably as much for its glamorous and, and elegant design with constructionist wall decoration and alto-esque undulating ceiling, as for the fact that it had been much uh, publicised. It shouldn't need mentioning, but it clearly does, that South Africa's state, state inauguration of apartheid policies dates from 1948, and that in 1950, the group Area Acts, designed to separate racial groups geographically, had been passed. This is the political context in which the apparently apolitical PR of a design like that for the South Africa Travel Centre, much praised by the modernist establishment, was staged. It's a good example of convenient forgetting, but the design was finished by early 1953, before Sterling came into uh, the uh, Cubit's office. What we do know for sure is that Sterling helped develop Cubit's designs for West African schools. Such projects were part of a new spirit in colonial building that Britain launched after, after the war in its post-war possessions, an, an architecture for, quote, development and welfare, in which modernism had a privileged role in signifying more benign policies and dealing with the irreducible conditions of the tropics despite continuing imperial control. Sterling's minimal involvement with such work does not license lengthy consideration of it, but it's important to say that this was bread and butter work for several such London-based practices. This range of relations between the welfare state and colonial architecture hinted at in the early careers of Sterling and Gowan was, was certainly neither a unique experience to them nor even among other avant-gardists. Take Allison and Peter Smithson. Their involvement with colonial architecture at this time was a little more direct than Sterling and Gowan's. There is, for example, a competition design made in 1952 to 3 for a head office building for the Uganda Electricity Board in Kampala. The design is ordered around two principles, a 16-foot square grid of supports separate from screen walls, and, and the, the idea of casing the building within air cushions or breezeways, one above uh, within the, the umbrella uh, roof and the other on two sides of the building within the shadow depth created between the true facade and the outside by four foot deep breeze soleil. The second of these principles is piquantly captured by an anthropomorphic reference. Quote, building appears like a nun's face in a coif face within a face, they wrote on one drawing on the lower right there. There's also the Smithson's Iraqi house in Piccadilly, London, of 1960 to 61. 
This, a new interior inside an Edwardian building, is another tourist office. And with its sunken display case for passing pedestrians to gaze down at, its undulating and sand-finished walls, its panels of, mos of mosaic and bas-relief, seems to do little but reinforce clichés about the Middle East. But then it's inconceivable a tourist office could do anything else, that it could be designed either against its remit or in some way that established a distinct or exemplary set of architectural positions. How can architectural history deal with works like Iraqi House and the Kampala competition design? Can we maintain a view of avant-garde architecture as an exemplary uh, ethical position regarding design, semi-autonomous from the world beyond it, resistant especially to the estate's idea of architecture. Are references to the contemporary political context of these countries relevant? And were they in, in the South African case? Could the very clarity of the Uganda Electricity Board design be imagined as offering some exemplary clarity of thinking on other matters? And is that then disabled by the nun's coif reference and all it casually implies about the history of missionary involvement in Africa? Is there in the Smithsons or Sterling and Gowns work any sign of a critical attitude towards empire? Oh. With Sterling, the Evidence of such a critical stance certainly appears minimal. There is a tampered photograph of the Queen's opening of the Flory building, in which Sterling inserted palm trees into the background, making what Rainer Bannum called a palm collaged anti imperialist satire. There is also a humorous drawing of the Victoria Monument in Liverpool, which reveals how it was placed atop a public convenience. But there is nothing in such instances to suggest anything other than schoolboy satires of the establishment. More seriously, elsewhere I have argued that Sterling and Gowne's work needs to be reconsidered in terms of how it attempted to treat the spaces of, of working class life as continuous with the forms of the Victorian city. I'm also fascinated by a state-sponsored project that Sterling was later involved in for Lima, Peru, one where Sterling reimagined an earlier design for consumer-oriented housing for, for the nuclear family in, in terms of mass housing for the extended family, a kind of systematised version of the do-it-yourself barriada. Both barriada and Victorian terrace offer coexistence at least, or creative hindrance at best, with state forms of building control, but neither evokes colonialism directly. There is, though, a significant avant-garde instance where a critique of colonialism is interpolated into the classed and zoned nature of post-war planning and housing under the welfare state. The Smithsons streets in the air, and specifically the Golden Lane competition design of 1952, have, much as the architects intended, long been an obligatory part of any account of attempts to reroute official post-war modernism. What has gone unnoticed is the way the Smithsons connected their critique of the way traditional working class identities were being uprooted with an alternative idea of socio-spatial identity. They linked their streets in the air with an image of a sea dyak's longhouse in Sarawak, this was part of the case they were making for a solution to housing needs which would fit more closely our real living patterns. The living form of a non-Western culture is offered as a precedent for the solutions the Smithsons were providing to the dual uh, problems of modernism and post-war housing. It endorses their project of urban re-identification. If the street had been, quote, invalidated by the motor car, rising standards of living and changing values, unquote, instead, as exemplified by the Longhouse Gallery, streets in the air were, quote, arenas of social expression, unquote. They were zones reverberating with ontological verities and significant encounters. <clears throat> 
where, quote, children learn for the first time of the world outside the family, a microcosmic world in which street games change with the seasons and the hours are reflected in the cycle of street activity, unquote. Uh, European interest in the Longhouse Gallery had a history. In the 19th century, longhouses were presented as platforms for a colonial encounter, stages on which war dances were enacted and human heads displayed. Much is made in the accounts of officials and travellers of the apparently insalubrious nature of these houses, their dirtiness, smokiness, lack of repair, untidiness, and lack of privacy. They are, they are utterly strange locales, places of no property, sites of intimately intermingled objects and bodies, missionaries worried about alcohol consumption and sexual activity within them, while colonial administrators saw how they enabled knowledge of the populace and its activities. But the Smithsons' use of the long house was quite distinct from these familiar tales of appropriation or even romantic affinity. They were not drawing on these traditions at all, nor even on the contemporary anthropology of Edmund Leach and others, which found a kind of anti-communist individualism in the Longhouse, a, quote, competitive and, egal and, and egalitarian society, unquote. Instead, the Smithsons were sourcing an anti-colonial uh, tradition found in the recent work of Tom Harrison, one of the founders of the social survey group Mass Observation. Harrison was linked to the Smithsons via their friends Nigel and Judith Henderson. Harrison had been fascinated by long, long houses since his 1932 visit to, to, to Sarawak. Soon after this, he had written his critique of academic and of, of, of academic anthropology and colonial exploitation in, in the New, New Hebrides, his book titled Savage Civilization, 1937. Savage Civilization, of course, doesn't describe those societies. It describes Western uh, society. For Harrison, the Longhouse was a, quote, real social unit, the heart of the Dyak's communal life, a building whose complexity lay in the myriad ways its spaces were used and understood, a building balanced between family and communal needs and bound up with social processes and identities. The point about Harrison's work in Bolton, in Lancashire, where, uh, where, where mass observation was first practiced, is not that he was turning the colonial gaze onto the exotic working classes in Britain, as uh, has sometimes been assumed, but rather that he, he was continuing this brand of reflexive, self-critical anthropology. And one part of this work was to challenge the long history of, of, of denigration of the, of the Victorian bylaw street, uh, the terrace, um, that uh, denigration which had especially been, been voiced by Garden City campaigners. Harrison compared these streets with the Longhouse Gallery. Quote, there is not a lot of difference between living in a Kenya or a Cayenne Longhouse and living in Davenport Street, Bolton, or any other industrial housing. Unquote. The doorstep seems to have particularly intrigued Harrison as a carefully marked and tended threshold between uh, kind of inner family space and outer public life. These doorsteps and the extension of private space to the curbstone, often depicted in, in mass observation photographs, are closely uh, reminiscent of Harrison's description of the relation between the, quote, allocated territory, unquote, around the family hearth and the, quote, open uh, territory uh, 
of the rest of the longhouse veranda. The nets hanging on the longhouse veranda are like the washing hanging on Bolton's back alleys. And the industrial street, seen usually as a corridor between terraces in sharply receding perspective, or as a plain of cobbles and granite sets, is the same kind of, of resonant stage with the same ordinary but significant placement of objects as the wooden deck of the Longhouse Gallery. Nigel Henderson, who associated with mass observation in the late 1940s, took photographs of children playing in the Longhouse Galleries of London's East End streets. Close emulations of images of similar uh, subjects in Bolton. Henderson tended to emphasise the palimpsestic aspects of the street scenes he photographed, graffiti, the marks of erosion, ageing and accident. But these were part of, of, of his view of the street as a sort of stage set against which people were more or less unconsciously acting. Like, like, like Harrison's Dyaks, they were driven, in other words, by a script which they took for granted. Henderson is credited with introducing the Smithsons to the social patterns of East End life, and his images of children playing were used by the Smithsons in their famous 1953 Siam Urban Re-Identification Grill to epitomise their argument that modernists must turn their attention away from urban planning based on zoning by function and towards the anthropological values embodied by the street. The Longhouse Gallery was, therefore, the site or mirage of anthropological uh, domicile, a now classic locus for the organic society whose loss was what was at stake for the Smithsons. And it was not spatial alterity, but spatial similarity that concerned the Harrison-Henderson-Smithsons nexus. What must be retained at all costs was the layered relation between private and individualised worlds and public and collective uh, uh, worlds. This, wo this was what they called doorstep philosophy. The, 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 uh, the architect's responsibility started, quote, from the moment the man or child steps outside his dwelling, unquote. But a balance must be achieved. Architecture must not disallow anthropology's subject, the everyday, from happening. Henderson's children must continue to play. The sea dyaks must be able to mend their nets. Now, I don't think streets in the air were the failure that most uh, commentators have judged them to be, or at least not in the same way. Unlike mass observations critique of, anthrop of anthropology, there was no equivalent critique of the architect by the Smithsons. Neither the would-be Golden Lane nor the actually built Robin Hood Gardens estate involved any element of user resident input that would take anything from the designing authority of the uh, from, the, from, from the designing authority of the architect, an absence that must loom large in any account of the problems in this form of housing. Also, unlike Harrison and mass observation, the Smithsons attempted no, prob no, prob no prob problematizing of the relation to colonialism. It is simply uncommented on in the text accompanying their longhouse photograph wished away as if our presence is not the focus of the dyaks in the photograph. Similarly, although streets in the air expected a rich everyday life, they also presumed a very docile inhabitant. Their target resident was the traditional, quote, respectable but mute end of the working classes. The architects were shocked when so-called problem families actually took up residence. And of course, the street's obsolescence is actually endorsed by these traffic-less passages. Whether this conforms any more to an accepted typology of the street is a question particularly critical to the subsequent vicissitudes of streets in the air. To put it simply, the wager taken out on streets in the air was to make modern architecture work 
with the everyday instead of intervening in it, governing it, colonizing it. Doorstep philosophy was not about diagram was not about diagramming the individual's relation to the collective through architectural form. It was about sociability, but it was also about accepting the limits of access, the threshold function of the doorstep. That there was also, as the Smithsons showed in their photo montages, an indication of how streets in the air could absorb but also be enhanced by American mass culture. All of the, these things were posited against the welfare state modernism that either kind of overly defined the character of collective life or that treated the collective as merely what was served by the calculus of housing production. So the challenge that streets in the air were meant to present was not to, to the procurement or management of welfare state housing. Rather, it was to the very idea of the of the everyday as something ruled by both custom and change, by the intractable and the private as much as by the communally recognizable, something that in short uh, cannot be colonized by the state. To return to the linked questions asked at the start of this lecture, how can colonialism be placed within the welfare state avant-garde relation and what effect does this have on the models used to describe that relation. I think we, um, we have some suggestions now of how to answer that. Colonial mindsets and experiences suffused the welfare state and its redistributive and rebuilding projects. The avant-garde were often, in common with much of the population, forgetful of Britain's continuing colonial entanglements, or they brushed aside the politics of this as they willingly engaged in architectural commissions that came out of those colonial connections. Just as the middling modernist practices they worked for or competed with for business were prepared to take on these commissions, so the avant-garde themselves would have taken on similar work. But the, but the avant-garde were, were also involved in revaluing the vitality of community life assessing the possibilities of continuity within, sorry, with the Victorian city. And so when the colonial experience threw up similar revaluing of the complexities of, of, of traditional life under colonialism, then this could be used as part of the avant-garde's salvage ethnography for the welfare state, even if their examples reduced to mere vestiges of anti-colonialism. Inserted into the welfare state avant-garde relation, colonialism uh, reveals an avant-gardism more limited but also more pointed in its criticality than it might seem in some models, and at the same time a welfare state broader and more complex in its architectural ramifications. Thank you. Students. Okay, thank you. A number of years ago, Helmut Jahn spoke here in the school, and uh, he was describing a number of recent projects, including one in Johannesburg, South Africa. And one of the students, to his credit, raised the problem with Helmut Jahn building in South Africa. This was still under apartheid. And he became very angry and said that his building was totally apolitical because its references to diamonds referred to every group in South Africa and therefore appealed to everyone, which is quite extraordinary if we look at, therefore, our connections to this colonial past. Now, the question that I have for you is, I think it was a fascinating talk, how might we 
try to bring in the groups within the avant-garde in different countries, including the United States, who were not directly involved, either by having come from a colony, having done projects there, or in the case of the Smithsons, having references that weren't spoken about. That was a difficult one, isn't it? So, yes, okay. How might we connect them, or how might they try to be connected? Which one of those two? Well, I'm not sure about how they might try to be connected. How might we connect them? I mean, I guess one of the ideas behind my paper is a kind of false hope, yeah? That if one positions oneself in a kind of, let's say, detached, or as someone who works in a distinct way from some mainstream, that that form of detachment might involve other kinds of criticisms, other kinds of differences. And I guess the answer that my paper gives is that it usually doesn't. Yeah, I just had a, a question to, to draw you out more a little bit on the claim of the anti-colonial reading in the Smithson's work. Um, an alternate reading might be that the, the image of the sea Dayak serves as a kind of uh, romanticized version of a sociability within the colonized other that's not alienated. And so it's a kind of romanticization yeah. and not necessarily yeah. uh, anti-colonial in that sense. Yeah. And the sort of pendant to that is in the... the the second photo montage that they did, they have an image of Nehru actually in the montage. So I'm wondering what, it, what would you make of the status of something like that as compared to uh, the sea Dayaks? Yeah, um, I think they're, they're romanticizing both the sea Dayaks and uh, Victorian bylaw street life. Um, and uh, you know, in the, in, the photo, in the photo montage by them, of course, there is Nehru, there's Terence Conran, there is uh, Marilyn Monroe and um, her, her boyfriend of that time. Thank you, Joe DiMaggio. Um, uh, what's Nehru doing there? Well, I think Nehru stood for something about being cosmopolitan at that time. I, th I think for the Smithsons he did. Um, I think he stood for um, kind of remaking... Uh, 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 a recent British colony into something exciting that the Smithsons might kind of identify their project with. He was the sponsor Yes, and he was, of course, the sponsor of Corby. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, but under false pretenses, in a sense, because obviously what uh, Corbusier wanted from that project was something very different from what Nehru wanted from it. Um, but that, that's not really relevant to the Smithsons, who probably just saw Nehru as the commissioner of this great capital, new capital city. Uh, yes, I find your presentation very intriguing because it is very disturbing. Um, when you look at colonial regimes around the world, what's interesting about them is how they have a great diversity of forms. And certainly the British Empire had a great diversity of different types of colonies, dominions, crown colonies, uh, protectorates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And each of these things had a different flavor, had a different establishment. That is important in terms of understanding the architecture that they produced. Now I see the period you're reflecting on ultimately, which is the pre-war, post-war period is one which leads to the formation of the Commonwealth version of the British Empire. And interestingly enough, this thing that everybody likes to present and see as such a positive thing, which is globalization, 
which is simply the architectural expression in, in its architectural sense of the current formation of capital in the world. Um, I say this as a preface to a, wanting to ask you a question and which might situate more properly your reflections on the work of Smithson because there is an obvious similarity between that house type in uh, the in Oceania, which you referred to, and his housing type. But one wonders, you know, how that, that, that process of selection was carried out, you know, because uh, there's a lot that's lost in translation, you know. And uh, a, I'm, I'm, I see where this is going, and I'm sort of asking a question for you to reformulate it yourself in the way that's appropriate from knowing the material, because you seem to have two different readings in your presentation at once, you know? One that is the required reading, which is ultimately very approving of uh, everything that goes into the avant-garde and globalization, and another one that is seeing the facts as historian sees of other realities that are kept silent, so to speak. Yes, I don't think that, that that's, that's um, a reading that most people would probably disagree with. I mean, my answer to the first question first question was very much along those lines as well that there's a kind of um, avant-garde hope um, and and then there's a different position which doesn't see much difference um, you know w w when I describe those four models and I f of the relationship between uh, the avant-garde and the welfare state and I I I kind of brought in a fifth one which I didn't call a model at all of course there are many accounts of this period in in terms of rebuilding Britain, of the welfare state, and its and its uh, and its uh, and its housing, especially, which totally ignore that distinction, and I have great sympathy for that position. In fact, um, at the same time, I think one should hold out hope as well. So, I think in a paper like this, one shouldn't just write a critical paper of w what one is trying to account for, what one is trying to describe. One should actually try to get at some of the hopes some of the some of the kind of utopian promises that there might have been as well i don't i don't see a problem with doing both um um when this this since we're uh, uh, developing this um, notions of, of streets in the sky and things like that, um, um, they were um, um, interested in and um, and um, and. Often evoke notions of um, of structuralism, uh, which um, at that point was uh, uh, was was kind of invested in um, linguistics and these kind of anthropological readings of um, of um, of like um, of cultures which had been uh, uh, Kind of isolated or separated um, from um, Western culture, um, and 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 taught to find kind of uh, fundamental structures in language and in culture, mm -hmm. and then um, um, obviously by the time we get to Sterling's later work, the notion of the language of architecture. Um, has a much, you know, kind of different meaning, and becomes almost a a language of the of a, of the tribe of architects, as opposed to a like a language of 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 the of the culture which, which the architects are in. Um, what can you say about the this kind of like um, attempt to Formulate um, ideas of 
of language or structure in this kind of work and, and how that was mobilized you know, um, in architecture. Yeah, um, you might know more about that than me, you probably do, um, but my understanding is that um, their close confederates, the, the Dutch, you know, people like um, Van Eyck, uh, were far more Levi-Straussian than the Smithsons were. Um, and and the, what, what the Smithsons knew of that, uh, well, they probably knew some of it, but they weren't as interested in it as the Dutch members of Team 10 were. Is that, is that your uh, reading of it as well? Um, I think so, yes. Um, I, I, it seems like also um, yeah, there's a tendency in architecture to kind of um, uh, pick up motifs and, and terms and then mobilize them for the architect's own purposes and maybe you know understand them or not, but, I, but kind of like remake them into some kind of a yeah. tool. And so I, I, I was more interested in the in the rhetoric of linguistics or anthropology. I don't think you find much of that rhetoric in the 1950s. I mean, I'm, I'm being very, very historically specific here, but I really don't think you find that rhetoric in, in Smithson's writing in the 50s. Um, and um, I, I do think that, that um, yeah, uh, Levi Strauss, I don't know how, how much he was actually read in, in Britain at that time, outside specialist, very specialist circles. The 1960s, yes. Um, and I do really think that this connection with Tom Harrison is the one uh, well, the one that I pursued because I think Tom Harrison is a, is a, is a much more interesting f figure than has uh, usually been assumed. Um, he's been, he's suffered a kind of, uh, um, a, a kind of uh, wrong-headed, I think, attacks on him um, in the 60s and 70s. And, and it's only really in the last 10 years or so that people have reassessed his work and I think really brought out its richness and complexity. And it's very, um, you know, people like Malinowski um, uh, tried to engage with him, but um, although he, he quite liked the fact that they might endorse his work, he also rejected most of what Malinowski stood for. That, that's the kind of, 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 um, of anthropological background that I think is relevant here, rather than Levi-Strauss. Thank you very much for the uh, really interesting presentation. I, I have a question that's maybe uh, very basic, but I just wonder what's at stake in maintaining the category of the avant-garde in the face of um, these larger processes you're talking about, colonialism and the welfare state. And I wonder um, if, you, if you could just articulate why the notion of the avant-garde is, is, one, of your tri is one, one of the terms in your triad. <clears throat> and because I... I I thought I sensed maybe you're trying to differentiate the Smithson's work from some of the other um, architects who had, you know, worked abroad in colonial situations, and I sensed a kind of privileging or a kind of defense of their status as an avant-garde kind of project. And, and I'm wondering if, if that the reading that I'm uh, getting is, is uh, you know, corresponds with what you're seeing, and if maybe you could just think, talk a little bit more about how you see the avant-garde uh, and the role of that category functioning yeah. in uh, your work? One of my uh, concerns is simply that um, I've moved recently into work on James Sterling and James Gowan, um, and um, that work involves, it's, in, it's, it's just really a study of their, of their practice um, and what they did before that. And it involves what I think is a, a very minute kind of a, attempt to disentangle the historical record from the myths that, that surround it. So it, in a sense, when one, when one does that, one cannot help but find the kind of things that I've presented here in their work and in the Smithson's work. So from that point of view, you know, I see colonialism as relevant and it has to, it has to be accounted for in the work of these people who are now, I think we can say, traditionally called the avant-garde. From the other point of view, I think one gets, a, I think, a much richer picture of what was at stake in this period, particularly the early, mid, and late 1950s. What was at stake in terms of um, 
welfare state housing especially. And what the, I mean, Streets in the Air was a hugely uh, kind of influential concept. You know, one doesn't, of course, just find it in the Smithson's work, but they articulated it in a way that seemed to make it a more interesting idea, a more interesting uh, typology than it had appeared in other projects. So in trying to kind of excavate what that might mean, I think it's important to, um, in the face of you know, what in Britain, in British historiography now, is a kind of almost total rejection of um, this period in terms of what it provided in terms of state housing, um, I think we need to, to look again at what that s certain aspects of that state, state housing could have meant, could have meant, maybe it didn't actually communicate that, but could have meant at the time. we can think of um, Smithson's examples and uh, images instead of seeing them as sort of ignoring you know, the presence of colonialism or colonial history uh, as part of actually constructing a new narrative of colonial exit you know, in which colonialism is reframed as uh, you know, a broader project of you know, humanist uh, project which will then continue in the post-war era. Mm -hmm. So you know, colonialism is seen of constructing a, you know, a, a long-term part of a long-term humanist project which then is seen to continue in the post-war era. Yes, um, I think that's, a, that's an interesting point and I think that w one could find examples of exactly what you're, you're pointing to there. Well, I think this is different, I think, is, I mean, we think of, of humanism as being, you know, the family of man, you know, everywhere, uh, we suffer the same conditions because we are human. Oh, we enjoy the same things because we are human. And I think, of course, that, that um, the this, this Smithson's project or the work of, if we join it with Henderson's and with Harrison, is actually about something distinct from, from, from that, which is to do with class. Um, and it's to do with, you know, I mean, these are all people not of the working classes that they seek to describe, that they seek to design for. But they're all people trying to find ways of bridging that gap, trying to find ways of, of kind of uh, finding uh, new ways of kind of understanding, coming to terms with the, the class nature of social housing. 